Sabina is a UX consultant at Siemens Corporate Technology in Munich, and she is sitting in Munich at the moment. Uh, she is passionate about exploring how technology impacts human behavior, businesses and society. But I believe we will focus on, on uh, human interaction in, in her presentation. And of course, when, when her topic is related to uh, autonomous systems, it's a very timely topic in the time we are living at the moment with COVID-19 uh, and with the digital leap most of us have had to take during the past few months as well. Sabine is, is a true expert on this as she has written her PhD on digital transformation strategies. So uh, her presentation will discuss automation, autonomous system and the human-centered approach, human-centered design in developing them. Um, perhaps here, Henrik, you, you could, you could uh, remind everyone how to communicate with Sabine, and then I will, I, I will have a question to Sabine before we let her start her presentation. Exactly. Thank you, Paivi, um, because as uh, equally important as our speakers are our participants and uh, being live uh, online, we encourage you, dear participants, to interact, to engage with us by asking questions uh, to Sabina. You can ask her a question or challenge her also uh, by uh, writing in a chat messages a question followed with letter Q and your name so we can know where the question comes from. Um, so I encourage you to use the use the chat, and we as moderators will be your voice uh, when, when discussing with Sabine after her presentation. Thank you, Henrik and Sabine. Now the question: uh, There's a manifesto uh, published for the Gdynia Design Days. Uh, actually, it was written by my uh, brilliant co-host Henrik. Uh, you see him him uh, present with us. And uh, it describes 11 values. I chose three values uh, of this set of 11 for today, to, which I found most important and most relevant in the context of what we are discussing today. And those three, they were the big picture, mm -hmm. not only in the environmental sense or waste related, but in big picture in every aspect, uh, the importance of it. Then the value itself, and a third is change agents. So, uh, because we all know that organizations have change agents and we hope to, to train change agents uh, through this two-day uh, event as well. So, from your point of view, which one would you pick as, as the one that speaks to you most today mm -hmm. in the context of, of today's program? Mm -hmm. Uh, for me, it's change agent because, um, yeah, what you said uh, in the end is I think everyone can can be a change agent in an organization. And that is something that I've always uh, or also seen during my PhD, because in the old times, it was like the big decision makers were making the decisions and designing the strategies for their organizations. And I think now that has shifted and I think everybody is more empowered and I think everybody can drive a positive change forward, no matter what career level you are or no matter where you are in the organization. I think that for me is something that like really resonates with me. Thank you. Thank you, Sabine. And, and you opened a very important angle to change agents uh, with your response as well. So now the, the stage okay. is yours for the next 20, 22 minutes or so. So okay. go ahead. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I wish I could have been uh, in Poland with, with all of you, but no, that didn't happen this year. Um, I'm going to share my screen so you can see uh, my, my slides that I prepared. So um, my talk today is on how to design human-machine interaction for uh, autonomous systems. So yeah, this is a topic that I am uh, I'm really interested in and I'm really passionate about and something that I do research on um, here at Siemens. 
Um, so autonomous systems, they are already here and they are already part of our lives. Uh, think about uh, autonomous cars that are coming. Elon Musk just said yesterday that he expects to have like a full autonomous car uh, very, very soon. Um, we'll see <laughs> about this one. But yeah, um, I think I'm really excited about technology in general, and I'm also excited about autonomous systems. I'm excited about robots, dancing robots. Um, we have our, yeah, for example, at our homes, we have um, hoovers that help us. We have smart assistants. We'll see when we have robots serving us breakfast and being our true assistants. So I think technology is fun. Autonomous systems are uh, a really cool topic also to, to look into. But um, now <laughs> I have to get serious here because now it's, it's not so great if these autonomous systems fail. And we have seen uh, at the end of 2018, beginning of 2019, we had um, we, uh, two plane uh, crashes um, of two uh, Boeing 737 MX-8 planes. And those planes crashed due to the same cause within just a couple of months. And the reason was that those planes were equipped with an uh, autonomous system that was actually meant to prevent stalls. Uh, and by that, it was like autonomously putting the, no the nose of the plane down. In that case, the system failed and it was like putting the nose down and the pilots were desperately trying to pull the plane back up again, but it didn't, uh, it didn't work. And those planes crashed and a lot of people died, unfortunately. And um, this is obviously the worst case scenario of something that can happen because the, tr the pilots were not trained properly on how these systems worked. They couldn't understand what was going on and they couldn't even see that there was an autonomous system in progress. And uh, uh, on the black box recordings of one of the planes, you could even hear uh, one plane in the last minutes like, flipping through the handbook and trying to find out what is going on. And at Siemens, we work on important projects. We work on our products are in factories. They are in power plants. You can find them in infrastructure um, uh, projects. So for us, this is like the worst case scenario. And this is something that is really important for us to design autonomous systems in a way that users can understand them and that users can, can work with them. So a short look back into the history and also to what exactly I mean when I talk about autonomous systems. So we have seen the development from manual systems and manual work to automatic systems. So systems that just uh, basically follow an if-then pattern and um, carry out different tasks um, autonomously, but limited to specific tasks. Autonomous systems, on the contrary, those have a certain uh, intelligence, and basically they can carry out entire workflows autonomously without having a human uh, to intervene in certain cases. So for the, for the history, I also think those, this development from manual to automatic, it was about scaling. So automation allowed us to do more of, of the, the things we did before. Um, and autonomous systems, I think, help us to improve and also to become more intelligent. And also, I often, I think autonomous systems, they uh, incorporate a lot of intelligence. So um, we all know about uh, artificial intelligence and those is heavily also used in, in autonomous systems. But autonomous systems would also mean that basically you can switch off the lights in a factory and you will not have any human involved uh, anymore. And I don't think that this is the case and we have seen that true autonomy of systems is still a bit further in the future. And so we will have still humans in the picture. And I think that is important to understand that humans are still, even if a system is autonomous, we will have humans having to interact with them. And also for a human, a system that might not uh, seem very intelligent or, or that might not uh, be very intelligent from a technological standpoint, it might be perceived as very intelligent from the, from the user. So the user doesn't care on which stage of the auto automation scale a system actually is. 
So when we look at the, the human context of, um, of users actually working with autonomous systems, there are a couple of things that we have to take into account. So the first is that people, they rely on previous knowledge and experiences. So when they are facing an autonomous systems, they apply the patterns and interactions and behaviors they know from other systems to these autonomous systems. So this is something that we have to keep in mind when we're designing for, for these systems. But also as autonomous systems are quite new, there are no like really uh, no standard patterns available right now. And so what we're designing right now for autonomous systems will then actually shape how, uh, how humans perceive autonomous systems in the future. Then you have, as a human, you have repetitive tasks um, that are maybe quite boring, that don't challenge you a lot. And you have creative tasks that require uh, intelligent problem solving from the human side as well. And of course, we have the, the idea that autonomous systems can just take all the boring, repetitive tasks away from us. So we have more time to focus on our creative, on our fun stuff, uh, on the tasks that really require us to think further, to think creatively, to use our empathy uh, on, uh, on things and yeah, to carry out these tasks. But is it, I don't know if it's really true that it's so easy to just take the, the repetitive tasks away from us um, because, yeah, that can also create some problems. And I'll get to this a bit later in the presentation. And the next thing is that humans also always have a certain attitude towards autonomous systems. And some users might be really excited about autonomous systems and others might be scared. They might be scared that autonomous systems robots will take their jobs away. And this is a real fear. And this will also influence how humans behave towards autonomous systems. Um, there are, uh, we have seen, for example, in factories when we introduce autonomous systems that some users are re really uh, opposed to, to these systems, that they try to sabotage them in a way to make sure that, the, that their boss still understands their value as human workers. And yeah, this is something that we just have to consider. So these are a number of topics that I am interested in, in human machine collaboration. Um, so from artificial intelligence to interaction possibilities, um, to machine to human communication or machine learning. Um, so all these topics are uh, basically make up the field of human machine collaboration for, for autonomous systems. And a lot of these topics are actually topics that we can design. So there are a couple of things, for example, the everything that is related to the user, so motivation factors, what you can see here uh, to the right, cultural background, age, uh, a gender experience or educational background of the users. Those are things that we just cannot influence. Um, we cannot influence things like legislation that is also becoming more and more important. Uh, because we do see more uh, regulation uh, towards autonomous systems coming up. Um, but things like interaction possibilities, uh, feedback of the, of the system, those are all things that we can design. And I will touch on uh, some of those when I show you um, some examples right now. So here are some uh, challenges and uh, also design uh, principles that we, can, that we can use when we're designing for autonomous systems. So my first example goes into the direction of trust. So how can we create trust towards autonomous systems? And the example that I'd like to tell you about here is the autonomous tram that Siemens presented in 2018 in Potsdam. So there was an autonomous tram train driving through Potsdam and it was introduced um, during, a, uh, during a fair and um, it was basically a prototype. And you could see that, uh, or maybe you could say that autonomous tram, hmm, in a lot of uh, cities, we do already have a lot of autonomous trains or subways that are just driving without, uh, without a driver. So what's so exciting about an autonomous tram? Um, but the tram drives within the traffic. So we have to take the traffic into account. So we have pedestrians, we have other cars, and so, 
anything might happen at any time. And so that makes it uh, a bit more tricky with a tram that actually drives in, uh, in traffic. So when we were looking at how to create trust, and in this case, um, we were looking at um, the passengers, um, then we thought about things like, okay, the tram should drive at a comprehensible speed. So you could have to see how far, how fast it actually drives. So it doesn't make any like sudden accelerations. It should drive in the same manner. So you can always understand how the tram drives and it must give feedback uh, through any way, uh, audio or visual feedback in case there's something happening and you as a passenger would have to do something or react to it. So those are, uh, are basically principles that you do. So what creates trust? In fact, uh, trust by, uh, or we create trust if we uh, eliminate things that users feel uncertain about. Um, because we use trust to guide us through uncertain situations, basically. And um, for the passenger, it also might look a bit different than for the drivers, but in this case, it was mainly towards the, towards the passengers. And uh, in practice, what we saw was actually quite interesting because the, the passengers didn't show any sign of uh, fear or doubt or uncertainty when uh, interacting with, uh, with the tram or when getting on board of the tram or off board. It was all fine. On the contrary, actually, we saw um, school children, uh, in fact, uh, very quickly realizing that when they, for example, pull out their arm or when they just... Uh, make a sudden movement that the tram would stop. And so they actually started to interact very quickly with the tram. Um, you could even say they started to like, um, yeah, basically block the tram in some cases. So that was like something that we didn't expect to happen at that uh, in that amount. But it is, I think, a very natural uh, um, behavior that users actually interact with autonomous systems as soon as they understand how they, how they react and how they work. So my second example or the second um, challenge that we have is about how to allocate control. So what are different levels of control and how do we allocate control between the human and the machine? And this is something that, yeah, um, can, get quite, uh, can get quite tricky because in practice, it's always different in any case. And uh, the example that I have here is the example of autonomous cranes in a harbor. So imagine you have a harbor, you have a lot of container ships, and you have the cranes that load and uh, offload the containers on the ships. And uh, in the former times, we would have on every crane, we would have one crane operator directly operating the crane. So he would sit up there on top, very high uh, above the ships, but he could directly feel and interact uh, and see what they were doing. And now, if we have autonomous cr uh, uh, cranes, those cranes uh, um, basically operate autonomously hundreds of ships potentially at the same time. And what that means for the crane operator is that they no longer sit on top of the crane, but they sit in a remote uh, workplace. They could even potentially sit at home, <laughs> which is not the case right now. But they sit in a remote workplace where they have cameras, where they can steer hundreds of cranes at the same time. And uh, how the system is set up is that those cranes operate autonomously, but they call on the human for help. So in case something goes wrong, there is a critical situation, there is a dangerous situation, the crane pings basically the operator and the operator then has to switch themselves on and see what is going on and react to that. And this is the idea of that we have that the crane is basically doing all the basic autonomous or repetitive work autonomously. And the crane operator only has to yeah, jump in in case of emergency. But what that also does is if you always have to jump in in case of emergency, you have a lot of stress and you have a lot of pressure and you always have to react uh, uh, fast and you have to understand basically a potentially dangerous situation very quickly in order to make the right decision then. So instead of having yeah, your normal working day, you're constantly in basically intervention mode. And that is something that 
we might not really want because actually we want to take stress away from the users. The other problem that we have for um, allocation of control and level of control is if we have this idea that in the end, the user is always the one to make the decision uh, or to make the final decision, then it can create a conflict because what happens if something goes wrong um, and you as the operator, you have the responsibility and then you are basically charged or made responsible for something that you didn't really have direct control of. The next example is that example of explainable AI. So how can we explain what is going on behind the scenes, behind those, those algorithms? And it is actually required that we, in some cases, we explain what happens behind the curtains to the users. So my example here would be from building technologies. So imagine you have a campus of various different buildings, for example, a hospital campus, and you're a facility manager who has to look at the, all the energy consumption, the heating, um, anything that um, you have to look after for a building. You have to switch on the lights, switch on um, the cooling system. And now these buildings make these decisions and these regulations completely autonomously. And so in a building, you can easily have thousands of sensors. So in case you need to understand what those buildings actually did, do you want to receive noti notifications from thousands, sen uh, thousands of sensors uh, who send like new data points every minute or every 15 minutes? This is something that you don't uh, want to handle. So when we think about how can we explain what happens uh, to a user of an autonomous system. In this case, we have to think about things like, do we need a real-time decision here? In that case, we have to be more, more, more quick and more precise. Do we require a really focused uh, explanation because we need to make this decision uh, very shortly and, um, and timely? Or do we, uh, would a detailed explanation be needed because it's very complex and there's a couple of things that happened? And also, um, is it a non-sequential envir environment where just something happens and you explain it? Or are there a couple of steps that happened before and then also you have to explain those to the user? So these are all questions to consider when we design an explainable AI system to the users. And then we can design interactions mechanisms. So. Um, in the old days, we always were thinking basically for systems, we have a graphical user interface. And in a lot of cases, we still do. But especially as autonomous systems become more and more um, yeah, ubiquitous in our lives, we also have a different kind of interaction. So we have this multimodal interaction, uh, speech interaction, um, um, yeah, haptic interaction. And so especially for, I would say for non-expert users, this is the case or this is um, um, well worth to consider because uh, non-expert users, they especially rely on really natural and yeah, known interaction patterns when interacting with autonomous systems. And then we also have to look into how do we, how does the system come across to the user? So should it look like a human? And if we think about robots, there are, um, in, in a lot of cases, we see robots that look like this, who are very cute and uh, fun and look like these, yeah, basically typical robots that we see from, that we know from movies. Or do we have a robot that really looks like a human? Um, and um, wouldn't, wouldn't that be a bit scary? <laughs> or wouldn't this be a bit, yeah, I don't know, make us feel uncomfortable if it's, if it's a hu or if it looks like a human, but in fact it is not a human. So there we also see some um, some difficulties here. So what do we take away from this, or what shall we what shall we do now? I think one thing is that we as designers, um, and I speak to <laughs> uh, basically also the the designers here, is that we have the right tools and the right methodologies to tackle these challenges. I think with our human-centered um, uh, thinking process and our human-centered um, methodologies, we can really address the right uh, issues and also deliver value by doing this. Because if we understand the user needs and the user context and the challenges early on in the process, 
then we can design a solution that addresses these issues, that increases user satisfaction and trust as well, that uh, we also avoid mistakes, um, and we reduce development costs or training costs because the solution is then just easy to, uh, to use and to understand. Think about that uh, plane example, that Boeing example that I mentioned in the beginning. I talked about this, um, this example with a colleague of mine, and he said, well, the reason for that crash was basically that the pilots were not trained. So just give them proper training and then the issue will be solved. But in fact, training costs can be a huge factor when it comes to um, selling these uh, huge autonomous systems. And so we want to reduce those training costs as much as possible, by not, but not by leaving the training away, um, because then bad things can happen, but by designing the system in a way that is understandable without a lot of training. Another thing that I think we can do is taking a closer look at our design process. Because what I have seen is that a lot of these systems are developed by engineers and they don't really think about putting designers or bringing designers to the table. And so we really have to be careful when, when we set up our teams um, who develop these, uh, these systems. Um, because if we only have engineers in the room, everybody will have an engineering mindset and we will always solve our problems with an engineering methodology. And, but by bringing different users uh, to the table, different stakeholders, um, people who have different backgrounds, and especially in STEM fields, we do have a very homogeneous uh, crowd uh, still around. Um, but by mixing different backgrounds, different methodologies, and having designers, especially in the process early on, when it is actually about designing the basics for, for a system, then we can engineer this human-centered mindset into our products very early on. And the last thing is about design guidelines. And we do have a, a lot of design guidelines around. Um, and those are not necessarily all outdated and all wrong. So for example, you have heard of Jacob Nielsen and the usability heuristics for user interface design. Those are from 1994. So basically from another age. <laughs> but those are still true. And, um, but maybe we have to translate them to an autonomous world. So for example, one of these heuristics is visibility of system status. So the system should keep the user informed about what is going on and give appropriate feedback. But for autonomous systems, maybe this is not enough. This is still not, it's still true, but it's maybe not enough. So things that we can add to this, um, to this guideline would be probably transparency of next action. So the user is informed about what the, systems is, what the system is going to do next uh, instead of just receiving the status. Or the system should explain and make clear why the user did what it did. So this idea of explaining um, the, the algorithm rhythms and explaining what the system did while the user wasn't involved directly. And also showing contextually relevant information because those systems are um, used in all kinds of contexts. And um, so this is something that is also important that we are context sensitive and display the information based on the situation that the user is actually in um, to make it then easier to use for the users. So with that, um, I'd like to close here. I'm um, really excited to hear your questions about it and uh, to go into the discussion. Um, please, um, if you have any questions after the, the session, please feel free to reach out anytime by email. You can also find me on LinkedIn and on Twitter. So um, I'd really like to hear from you. And so far, thank you very much. Thank you for your presentations. We Thank do you. have uh, questions from the audience that I've passed on to Pivi. Thank you, Henrik. And thank you, Sabine, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, it's it's uh, all clear that these are the topics we need to continue discussing at the moment uh, and, and to a much larger extent than what, what usually happens in my mind. Um, I already have two questions for you from the mm -hmm. audience. Habeb from Austin, Texas, mm -hmm. uh, wants to ask you, 
Do you see autonomous systems fulfilling some visions of the future uh, that replace too many human jobs and operations? Uh, this is a fir the first question and the second, or is it more of a shift to different jobs, tasks and operations by humans? So basically replacing mm -hmm. or uh, shift to different jobs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Um, I would say both. And I think what, what teaches us here is if we look back into the history and back into the past, um, because we always had technological shifts and some were also, also like really intensive. And um, so one of the stories maybe that we know that in, in the old times we had um, uh, basically gas lighters. So people who walk the street, eat, eat street each night to light all the street uh, lights. Um, and this job completely um, disappeared with the introduction of electricity. So, um, and nowadays this is completely normal to us. So yes, I think a lot of, um, or basically it will be a shift towards new jobs and new tasks. But also, I think we shouldn't forget um, how we design this shift and how we design this transformation because um, people losing their jobs to, um, to autonomous systems, um, it's, a real, it's a real and it's a problem. And um, so we have to really design from basically also from a political standpoint, from legislation, what we do there. Um, because realistically, not everybody who is basically working um, on a conveyor belt can then just simply be a data scientist. Um, so we really have to think how we, um, how we manage this shift and how we um, basically yeah, moderate this this transformation. But I think that's what we what we are here for, <laughs> and I think that's what we need to need to do and push towards. Thank you, Sabine. Um, I I think you took up raised a very important aspect of autonomous systems and the role of design as well, because basically, if I understood you correctly, you are talking about design in the sense of design of the big picture as well, which exactly. is part of <laughs> manifesto, that, that uh, it's not only about the systems uh, limited in the limited sense, but about yeah. these societal systems as well. Yeah. Now, my, my, I have to continue here with, with a, a question related to that, which is, do designers have opportunities to designing the the big picture as well, uh, mm -hmm. or is it more in the field of autonomous systems and user experiences? What what is your uh, experience of that? Yeah, I think so. Who so two things to that. So the first thing is what I had on my second last point is that if we bring in designers, not only when it is about yeah making the interface pretty, <laughs> basically what still happens a lot of times, but if we are involved in the early stages when it is about actually creating the vision for a product, um, creating like the basic idea of a product and really understanding what, for example, what problem this product should solve, I think that already helps a lot. Um, and today, this, yeah, as I said, it's not so often the case, or in a lot of cases, maybe it's, it's, yeah, designers are brought in a bit too late, I would say, in the in the process. Um, the other thing is also who's a designer, uh, and I think a designer is not only someone who can operate sketch and who can uh, who can draw and who can, but designer basically is someone who can solve problems, and I think by that, by applying this. Um, human-centered designer mindset, I think this this mindset basically is something that can also um, help here. So it's not only about the, the designers, but I think that we have to, we have like good methodologies um, and yeah, spread, spread the word here. Mm, thank you. Yeah, I, I think again, you, you touch important issues the early on involvement in, in a very early stage. This is, of course, relevant in many design uh, fields as well and uh, applications, certainly. And the second is who is a designer? And, and in that, I think, I believe you are touching one of the most interesting topics in current design discussion, who really is a designer. And I, I appreciate your sort of open view 
to <laughs> who can do design. Thank you for that. And uh, I will have I will have another question, or actually two questions for you. Uh, we will we will have time just to take both of them. Uh, Agatha is asking, where do you think we will be in ten years? as far as autonomous solutions are concerned, is much going to change in that time or is the development slower? Uh, <laughs> I have no clue. <laughs> um, I think what we, what we did see is that in the past years, we had a very uh, fast uh, transition. If we think about mobile technologies, they've only been around for um, yeah, a very short uh, period of time. So I think it could as well be that in uh, within uh, 10 or 20 years, we see uh, like a huge development there. Uh, on the other hand, I can also think that we sometimes have this idea that everything will be completely different. Um, and I, then I, again, I think maybe still a lot of things will also remain. Um, I cannot answer that question. And I think nobody seriously can. I have a book actually here um, where that asked a lot of great minds uh, about artificial intelligence and where it goes and when it will be basically equal to humans. And I think the, the estimations there were from like 10 years to 250 years. So I think the smartest minds in our world cannot really make um, their minds up about it. We will see. <laughs> Thank you. A good good answer. Maybe this is uh, also related to what has been discussed earlier today already, and this is in the context of the pandemic. No one could see that coming. And what, but what what Leila uh, Ajarolu was was saying is that. Uh, the learning lesson from the pandemic should be that we prepare ourselves better. Mm -hmm. So maybe this is true with autonomous systems as well, that a wise society, a clever society prepares itself two different scenarios. And then even if we can't uh, predict what which scenario will be true, we are prepared when things start happening. Now, the last question, Zuzana from Berlin is asking, how do you think the com companies will tackle the trust issues of customers who are concerned about autonomous systems gathering their daily data and storing them, or maybe using uh, the data in an inappropriate way? What is your answer to this tricky question? <laughs> that is also a tricky question. How are they going to do it? I think um, that is something that also we as um, as designers, or but also from um, basically from a legislation standpoint, I think we need to make sure that we set the boundaries of what we want to happen. And because I think from um, organizations, in many cases, they will operate from um, to fulfill their business goals, um, which is not wrong because that is what they have to do. Um, and if um, we, as basically the society, we have concerns towards um, data uh, privacy uh, about usage, then we have to set the boundaries there. Um, and so I think it is a problem that, or that is something that cannot be just done by the organizations themselves, um, because then they probably will not do it in the way that we would like it. Um, but this is something where we have to have like a discussion um, within society, with um, legislation, with organizations, with um, basically users uh, to yeah work out how we want it to happen. So this is not a question that should be left with individual um, businesses, companies alone, but needs a wider uh, collaborative approach. Yeah, yes, I, I would right. definitely think so. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope all the, all the three great people who asked the questions are satisfied with the responses. And if you want to continue the discussion or any one of you have, have more questions, uh, Sabine was kind enough to share her uh, contact details. So please feel free to continue the discussion with her directly. Yes. Thank you very much, Sabine. Thank you. It was fun. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> 
Oh, pleasure. It was such a good presentation that I'm sure we would have been able to continue the discussion for the rest of the day. But we will now say goodbye to you. Wish you good luck. Yes, bye. thank you so much. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you, Sabina. We'll thank be in you, touch, bye. all yeah. of us. Bye bye.